If, I, if we went around the room and I asked everybody in the room, where are you from? And I didn't mean, are you from Arlington or Wellesley or Chelsea or Hingham? Where are you from? Each of us has an immigrant story. E pluribus unum. Out of many people become one American people. That's on the great seal of the United States. President Trump wants to half cut immigration in half. And he basically wants to bring in a lot of Norwegians. <laughs> Nobody wants to come from Norway. They just <laughs> won 39 medals in, in the Olympics and they've got the most beautiful life imaginable. But there are, there are hardworking people from Sub-Saharan Africa who want to be Americans and from Pakistan and Bangladesh and from Malaysia and Indonesia. So my name is Mary Eintema, and I serve as president of World Boston. Um, I am very pleased to introduce both of them at the same time. Ambassador Barbara Stevenson is an active duty member of the American Foreign Service uh, for over 30 years now. Uh, she was elected president of the American Foreign Service Association in 2015. Previously, she served as dean of the Leadership and Management School at the Department of State Foreign Service Institute where she helped prepare ambassadors and other senior leaders. 2008, she was appointed ambassador to Panama and later became the first uh, deputy chief of mission and chargé d'affaires at the US Embassy in London. As deputy senior advisor to the secretary and deputy coordinator for Iraq from 2006, 2008, and I think we're gonna return to that time period, uh, she won the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award for developing and implementing the civilian surge that helped improve governance and reduce violence in Iraq's provinces. 2001-2004, as American Consul General in Belfast, she worked on the Northern Ireland peace process. 1998-2001, uh, she served as Consul General and Chief of Mission in Curaçao, where she was responsible for the five islands of the Netherlands Antilles, as well as Aruba, both of which became hosts of US Air Force forward operating locations during her tenure. I think we're gonna return to that topic too. Um, <coughs> Earlier in her career, Ambassador Stevenson served as Special Assistant to Undersecretaries for Political Affairs Peter Tarnoff and Tom Pickering, covering European affairs, including the war-torn Balkans. Other assignments have include Desk Officer for the UK, Political Military Officer in South Africa, and Political Officer in The Hague, San Salvador, and Panama. Ambassador Stevenson speaks Spanish and Dutch and some French and holds an, a BA, MA, and PhD in English, English literature uh, from the University of Florida. And please join me in welcoming Ambassador Stevenson. Thank you for coming up to DC to be with us and bringing beautiful weather with you. Uh, so Ambassador Nicholas Burns is known to many of us here in Boston. Uh, he is the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He served in the US government for 27 years. As a career foreign service officer, he was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008 and previously served in a variety of roles, including US Ambassador to NATO and to Greece. Uh, Ambassador Burns has received 15 honorary degrees, the Presidential Distinguished Service Award, the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, among others, and has a BA in History from Boston College, an MA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins Sice, and earned the <coughs> Certificat Pratique de Langue Française I'm trying, uh, at the University of uh, Paris Sorbonne. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Burns. The topic for tonight is the state of state. And I thought we would, I would open with a few remarks about what we at state, and particularly we in the American Foreign Service actually do and why it matters for America writ large, for our global leadership, and right here in Boston. Now, as the notice um, announcing this event said, I sent, sent up some alarm signals in November in a column entitled Time to Ask Why about the damage being done to the Foreign Service. Ambassador Burns, who I'm so proud to be sharing a stage with tonight, then followed up with a compelling op-ed in the New York Times entitled, Dismantling the Foreign Service. 
I propose exploring that issue, the dismantling of the Foreign Service in its nuts and bolts, during the conversation that follows our remarks. I'll be honest, it involves a number or two, and numbers are much easier to follow in bite-sized Q&A than they are as a big presentation. So that's how I plan to do the order. Good with everybody? Excellent, thank you. Let me begin then with a word about the American Foreign Service, America's diplomats, people like Nick and me. As Foreign Service officers, in both our cases we're political officers, we joined at entry level, similar to the military. Then we worked our way up the ranks, learning the art of diplomacy one tour and one posting at a time. I started out in Panama doing human rights and counter-narcotics under the regime of General Manuel Noriega. There was the most exciting first tour ever. <laughs> After that, I learned Dutch and for a posting in the Netherlands where our daughter was born. And then back to Central America, I volunteered for war duty with this infant for a two-year tour in El Salvador, strengthening democratic processes, and then working on the peace agreement that brought an end to that long civil war there. I remember James Baker coming down to bless the whole thing and sitting there not believing that this is what I got to do for a living. I went to Washington to be desk officer for the United Kingdom after that. Like most Foreign Service officers, I spent over two-thirds of my career posted abroad, mostly in embassies, American embassies in capital cities, but then also later to Willemstad, Curaçao, and Belfast, Northern Ireland to head our consulates there. So what do we actually do at those embassies and consulates? So as I tell members of Congress, no matter why your constituents are abroad, whether that's to adopt a baby or to expand a business, climb a mountain, study abroad, build a house, a set of houses for habitat on a mission for your church. All those constituents can count on the embassy as a home base. The embassy, the American embassy, is staffed with real Americans like me who also happen to speak the local language, understand the local environment, and know how to get things done, from moving stuff in and out of the country to convening the right people to tackle a problem, to traveling up country during the rainy season, which can be a real challenge in some places. The American Foreign Service maintains an enduring presence in all but four countries in the world. We operate 273 embassies and consulates all around the globe, still more than any other country, though China is closing in with 268 diplomatic missions in the last count. Americans at home count on us too, though often in ways that are less obvious. So let me just see a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to Paris or London or Dublin or another European city in the last decade or so? See, all of you. So. Now think back on your last trip home to Boston. You're sitting on the tarmac in Europe, waiting to take off, and you're looking around at all those other passengers with you and maybe wondering a little bit about their bona fides? Fear not. Those immigration officials at Logan Airport know about the background and the date of birth, and they've done name checks on all of the passengers that are on that plane with you before it ever leaves the tarmac. How did that come about? It took years of negotiations from American diplomats with the European Union to set up this exchange of passenger name records. But having it means that um, you're safer and we're able to keep threats at a safe distance. So this is one of the things American diplomats do. We just regularly use our embassies as platforms to negotiate and service agreements that enable close law enforcement cooperation and efforts to counter terrorism and keep threats at bay. Down at the seaport, I'll bet there are at least a couple of ships with Massachusetts-made medical equipment that are bound for ports around the world. American diplomats recently worked with a convinced the Latin American government to stop backroom deals that were tipping contracts to local firms. The firms were selling defective dialysis equipment and patients in that country were dying in alarming numbers. The government agreed after persistent urging from the embassy to a transparent and competitive bidding process. Not surprisingly, because when it's fair, this is never a surprise that the American company wins, Baxter Medical won that government contract. And as a result, 
patients began to receive quality care, an American company grew its overseas market. Diplomats do this every day. We're at work all over the world ensuring that American businesses face as level a playing field as possible, that procurement processes are fair and transparent, and that American companies who don't and can't pay bribes, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in this country, and it's got a long arm, that American companies get a fair shake. And if you want me in the Q&A session to talk about the impact of enabling more great American companies to get a foothold overseas, well, I'd welcome that. I have a jam-up story about the London Olympics and what American companies did there. So come back to that if you want to hear more. But here's a question for you. Why do you need to come to the Boston Public Library on a gorgeous evening to hear in person what America's diplomats do for you? In part, it's because done well, our work is often nearly invisible. Unlike our colleagues in the military, we, we don't wear uniforms and we don't have any tanks or ships or missiles and nothing goes boom. What we have is our people, and they work to build up metaphoric bank accounts of trust. Um, they build up relationships with years of cultivating the relationships with allies and, yes, with our adversaries as well. We learn as diplomats the skill of coaxing a partner overseas to yes with the maximum residual goodwill and the least trace of our efforts, the lightest touch possible. When I train new political and economic officers, I remind them that great diplomats listen carefully and they try to understand our partners overseas so that we can figure out a way to frame our request that enables our foreign partners to say yes with pride and to fully own the path ahead. Done skillfully, diplomacy not only delivers today, but it also builds the relationships of trust that lay the groundwork for future and deeper cooperation. When a crisis hits or an opportunity appears, we draw on those relationships to address the crisis and seize the opportunity. Because we maintain an enduring presence, because we work and live and break bread in Panama and El Salvador and Curaçao and Northern Ireland and Ghana, we have real relationships with people in that country. People we can call immediately to work out arrangements, to bring in reinforcements to contain an Ebola outbreak. People we can work with to establish standards in the banking sector to close the space for money laundering. People who trust us when we make promises about how a new Air Force base is going to be used. People we ask to take a risk for peace with the promise that we will stand by them if they do. Our daughter, who aspires to be an American diplomat, once gave me a card in this lovely handwritten calligraphy with a memorable quote from Lao Tse, the great Chinese philosopher. You've probably heard this quote before. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. And the same can be said for much of our work as diplomats. Under many circumstances, diplomacy delivers best when the people we work with say, we did it ourselves. And that makes telling stories about how we deliver for the American people inherently tricky. The relationships we form are real and lasting, and describing how we coaxed a partner to yes can feel a bit cheap and transactional. That said, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> and this is a story about transforming policing in Northern Ireland. And the good folks of Boston contributed to this story. And to be honest, the good folks in Northern Ireland widely say that this story's happy ending would never have happened without the help of the American Consulate General in Belfast. So in this case, I don't feel like I'm betraying any confidences or selling any friends short by telling you the story. Here it is. How many of you are familiar with the Good Friday Agreement? Excellent. It put an end to what? The Troubles. Exactly. So one of the challenges of the Good Friday Agreement um, was this lingering distrust between the Catholic community and the police force. It was really a very central issue in the, in the, 
in the conflict. And the police force, it was called the Royal Ulster Constabulary. The Good Friday Agreement called for the Royal Ulster Constabulary to be transformed, to be less a paramilitary force and more a community-based policing organization, one that would be capable of winning the trust and the confidence of the Catholic or nationalist population. So given America's role in achieving the Good Friday Agreement, one of the central goals of my tenure as Consul General in Belfast was to support this transformation of policing. The new police force would have a new name. It would be called the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And it would be accountable to a new policing board made up of politicians um, from those represented in the new uh, devolved legislative assembly in Northern Ireland. So as part of our ongoing program of support, the consulate organized a kind of international visitor program to take members of the new policing board to bring them to America so that they could see how we deliver community policing. Can I see a quick show of hands? How many of you have ever been involved in um, helping host international visitors? <laughs> Yes, citizen diplomats, we thank you. Your role is vital. Thank you for this. So just as our policing board is about to depart for their big trip to America to look at community policing, politics took one of its periodic turns for the worse, and pessimism set in as it can up in Ulster. The new policing board that was so critical to the success of accountable community-based policing was destined to splinter and fail. Everybody said this because the first challenge, which was to create a new policing badge, was just too hard. Symbols carry outsized significance in Northern Ireland, and the first thing they had to do in the midst of this toxic political environment was come together and figure out a badge that would be a symbol of what the new policing order would look like. It wasn't going to happen. So everybody said, well, they were glad that the American consulate was sending the policing board off on this because this was probably going to be the end of the new policing order. So there we were, loads of optimism about the whole thing. Now, I already told you this story has a happy ending. Not only did the members of the policing board learn a lot about community policing from visits to New York, Washington, and yes, Boston, but removed from that divisive, polarized politics, that environment back home, you know what they did? They got together and actually drew up and designed a beautiful new policing badge. And it's a six-pointed badge, and it has symbols that absolutely resonated for the unionist population, the torch of justice, the scales of justice. But it also has a harp and a shamrock, making room for the Catholic community. And it also has a crown. When I asked a friend on the board when he got back, a, a Catholic friend, how he had been talked into agreeing to the crown, especially with all the suspicion within the Catholic and nationalist community about crown justice. He shrugged and he smiled and he said, hey, looks like a bishop's crown to me. <laughs> <laughs> so when America plays this role of honest broker and it brings old enemies together and it brokers peace, when America fulfills a promise, and in this case it was a specific promise delivered as a Christmas tree was lit in Belfast, it went like this. If the people of Northern Ireland are prepared to take risks for peace, the people of the United States will stand with them. When we do these things, we enhance America's standing in the world. We bolster our global leadership, and we remind people that America is the indispensable nation. So that's how that story ends, and that's why it matters to American global leadership that it ends well. I'm going to end with a short vignette that doesn't end so well. What happens when we're not there? Congressman Ed Royce, the Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, spoke about this last September at the outset of a hearing on our topic, the state of state. When we depart, he said, we create a void for unfriendly actors to step in and promote interest hostile to our interests. Where there's a diplomatic void, we have no eyes, we have no ears to detect the next threat or the next opportunity. He then told a story about how Boko Haram, the terrorist group that's infamous for kidnapping schoolgirls in Nigeria, took control in northern Nigeria after the American consulate in Kaduna was closed during the budget cuts in the mid-90s. He said, Boko Haram emerged seemingly out of nowhere. 
We have no diplomatic presence at all in northern Nigeria because we closed our consulate in Kaduna in the 1990s. China certainly isn't trimming back its diplomatic presence there, as you know. The governor of that state, where now Boko Haram holds sway, Chairman Royce continued, told me that money was flooding into the area from the Gulf states, setting up at that time madrasas to recruit. He told me about a madrasa across the street from the school where he got his education. Young boys were wearing bin Laden t-shirts, and he explained what the consequences were going to be, and he was right. But we have to have that presence on the ground to see these kind of things coming. It has to be our foreign service that is there, Chairman Royce concluded. So I couldn't agree more with Chairman Royce. Our presence matters. American global leadership is simply not plausible. It's not sustainable without it. So let me offer these final thoughts in closing. The United States has enjoyed a position of unprecedented global leadership during our lifetimes. This leadership was built on a foundation of military might, economic primacy, tremendous cultural appeal, and diplomatic prowess to channel all that power, hard and soft, into global leadership that has kept us safe and prosperous at home. I hope my daughter and your children will be able to stand here one day and say the same thing. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Nick Burns. I want to thank World Boston for making it all possible. I was in the seaport this morning speaking to, on that beautiful morning, speaking to a business audience in one of those un unbelievable steel and glass buildings looking out on Boston Harbor. And it's no secret why World Boston's important right now. Because for nearly 400 years, and it's nearly 400 years, I think it's 388 right now, we in Boston have always been an outward looking people. The harbor's there, the Atlantic Ocean is there. Boston became wealthy and became the dominant city in the country in the 16th and 17th centuries because we had the courage to have a shipping trade and to export our products and to travel and to do business with the rest of the world. That's who we are. And so we have to have a first-rate World Affairs Council here. We do, under Mary's leadership, under the board's leadership. So I'm really thrilled to support you tonight because your mission's important at a time, I think, of really existential challenge for our country. Barbara's given you a sense of what the Foreign Service of the United States, uh, we both served in it, and Barbara's still in active duty, does for the country. But we've got to have a discussion with 320 million Americans about our purpose in the world. I interviewed uh, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice last summer at a public forum in Aspen, Colorado, and I asked her to tell the audience what she thought the major challenges were, and she surprised me with her answer. She didn't talk about the legion of difficulties and opportunities we have. She said, we've lost our self-confidence. Barbara just told you the truth. We've been the primary power in the world over the last 73 years since the end of the Second World War. No one's had more economic weight in the world. And Boston's a big part of that with our biotech uh, industry, both in Kendall Square, Cambridge, and in the seaport, with our hospital complex, with the scientific talent in this city, with our higher education. We've been a big part of that. No one's better, been a stronger military power in the world than the United States. We all know that. We spend more in our defense about $750 billion a year, then the next 10 countries, China, Russia, Germany, Britain, France, spend together on their defense. No one's had more cultural appeal from the promise of our Bill of Rights and the Constitution, the Declaration, I should say the Constitution as amended. Martin Luther King, Apple, Google, Amazon, and modern times, Hollywood, we've got cultural appeal, soft power. And so we've got this Big responsibility to use that power wisely, and by and large, we have. We've made some mistakes, but by and large, over the last 73 years, since the spring and summer of 1945, when the Second World War ended, we've helped to make this a more liberal, democratic, peaceful, just, and stable world. And that's a big responsibility for any one country to have. We need a first-rate military, and we're both big supporters of the military. One thing you do in the Foreign Service, you serve alongside the military. 
When I was ambassador to Greece, we had an important naval base. We still have it in Suda Bay on, in Crete. And so I worked very closely with the Sixth Fleet. When I was ambassador to NATO, that's a combined State Department, Defense Department mission. I had more civilians working for the Pentagon and flag officers, uniform officers working with me than I did State Department diplomats. We just work hand in glove. One of the takeaways of my career uh, serving, I spent a lot of time in West Africa and the Middle East, um, spent a lot of time working on Russia during five years at the White House of the National Security Council was on, in NATO on 9-11, that the United States is strongest when we integrate our ability to project force, that's the military, but also our ability to negotiate and get our way without firing a shot. And integrating diplomacy and defense, I think, is the key, one of the key lessons we teach our students at Harvard Kennedy School, where I teach now, just across the river, that America has to do both well. We have the greatest military in the world. We never want to be number two or three after China or Russia in the next few decades. And we can talk about that tonight. But we've got to have a first-rate military, excuse me, first-rate diplomacy, foreign service. And we're in danger of losing it. Barbara will give you all the figures. She leads the American Foreign Service Association. I'm one of her members, card-carrying, dues-paying members. So she's my leader. But let me just give you a sense of what's happening. State Department budget is going to be $58 billion in 2018. It sounds like a lot of money. It's about 1% of all federal spending. The increase that Congress voted for the Department of Defense two weeks ago, the increase of DOD's budget is going to be $62 billion. $62 billion the increase in the DOD budget, which will total over $750 billion, exceeds the entire budget, not just of the State Department, but of USAID, of all US foreign assistance. The $3 billion for Israel, the $1.3 billion for Egypt, of PEPFAR, the wonderful work we've done with HIV and malaria and polio prevention. Everything we spend under the sun, the United States of America, that has to do with international life, all that's $58 billion, and just the increase in the defense budget exceeds everything we do in the civilian side. That's not smart. And it's not right. And it's not right for President Trump and Secretary Tillerson to try to cut our budget, Barbara's budget, the State Department budget, my brethren's budget, by 30%. They tried it last year. Barbara and I both testified before Congress and said, this is, this is penny wise, pound foolish. If you cut the State Department by 30%, you're going to have to cut women and men on the payroll because we don't have tanks and fighter aircraft and aircraft carriers. We've got people. We have Arabists and Sinologists and Latin America experts and Africanists, people who know the culture and the languages. We negotiate peace for the United States. We intervene in the toughest situations. Our people are on point in dangerous situations. We've both faced terrorist threats to us and our families in our career. But we do it because the United States needs women and men to do this to be a truly great country. If you cut the budget by 30%, it's an ideological agenda, basically to say we're all about the military. We're all about the fist. We're all about confrontation and trying to overpower people, not to meet them halfway, not to think you know, North Korea is a good example of this. We might want to talk to the North Korean government before we hit them might save a lot of lives in the Korean Peninsula if we do that. We're not pacifists. We're out to protect the United States. If diplomacy fails, there have been times in our, both of our careers we've had to, we have supported the use of force. But if you can avoid a war, avoid putting young Americans into harm's way, avoid overusing the military, you ought to do it. And that's why you have to have a fully funded and fully fledged American Foreign Service. Cutting. Thank you. Here's what's happened since January 20th at 12.01 p.m. 2017. They tried to cut the budget by a third. Congress is trying to prevent it. Congress said, we're going to fund you. Secretary Tillerson said, I won't spend the money. There's a constitutional problem there. Congress makes the laws and appropriates the money. We in the executive branch have to carry out the will of Congress. 
President Trump and Secretary Tillerson are not doing that. That's point number one. They fired four of the most senior officers we had. This never happens in the federal civil service. When your time comes, they say you might think about leaving in six months. You've had a great career. We love you. We support you. Make way for a younger person. We all do that. We all know when the time is. But to be fired because you served Secretary Clinton or Secretary John Kerry or President Obama, we serve Republicans and Democrats. We're nonpartisan. I started out in the Jimmy Carter administration, but I served Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, as well as Bill Clinton, as well as President Obama on an advisory board for Secretary Kerry. We're nonpartisan. And yet they came in and fired Christy Kenney, the counselor of the State Department, career foreign service officer, Tom Countryman, our senior nuclear weapons negotiator, Pat Kennedy, the heart and soul of our administrative officer corps. They just fired him. Your last day's Monday, out. They haven't filled, they've not filled the majority of ambassadorships around the world. So as we speak tonight, we don't have an American ambassador in Seoul, South Korea. And the most dangerous place for the United States in the world today is Seoul and Pyongyang, South and North Korea. We don't have an American ambassador in Germany. We don't have an American ambassador in Saudi Arabia. We don't have an American ambassador in Japan. We've never had an administration in 100 years that hasn't filled our senior ambassadorial posts. When President Trump was asked about this in November, Fox News he was asked the question, why aren't you appointing career diplomats to their senior level posts? I'm the only one that matters, our president said. I'm the only one that matters. Imagine a leader of your company, your university, your nonprofit, saying, I'm the only one that matters. He's the president. He truly matters. But he has a core of patriotic, loyal, hardworking, skillful, smart people in the Foreign Service who are willing to serve him. And yet, our ambassadors aren't out at posts. He hasn't appointed people for Congress to confirm. Our assistant secretaries of state, our big senior line managers, about 25 people, the majority of them haven't been appointed. So you walk up to the seventh floor of the State Department where the Secretary of State sits, our Deputy Secretary, our Under Secretary, it's like a ghost ship. A ghost ship. And so America is AWOL. And think of the challenges we have around the world. Think of the challenges we have with climate change and trafficking of women and children, which is a worldwide scourge, and trying to combat drug and crime cartels and trying to fight off the pandemics that Barbara talked about. And the whole host of cyber issues, cyber criminals trying to break into your iPad and your iPhones uh, and steal your personal information and your banking information. A Russian government that launched a conspiracy, multi-million dollar conspiracy, to break into the databases of 23 of our states to undermine the sanctity of our 2016 election. Think of all those transnational problems that every country's facing. We're facing. The Atlantic and Pacific don't protect us. These are 21st century threats. Diplomats are going to be the key to all of them. And we love and admire the military. But the military would be the first to tell you they have a limited scope and limited ability to affect change and to defend us. And we need civilians to do the work of defending us on all the issues that I talk about. Think of Europe, our largest trade partner, our largest investor into our economy, the largest number of American allies in the world, 26 European countries in NATO. The Europeans are facing Brexit. They're facing homegrown terrorism much more severely than we are here in the United States. They're facing the rise of right-wing anti-democratic populism, people like Marine Le Pen, who have more in common with the Kremlin than they do with democratic Western values. They're facing Vladimir Putin, who's invaded Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine and stolen Crimea. We have big challenges there. And if the United States is not there, if we can't fully staff our embassies, we're not going to be able to defend our vital interests in Europe that are so important to us. I remember what the Europeans did for us on 9-11. I was a very new American ambassador to the NATO alliance. I was in Brussels, Belgium. We couldn't reach the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. They'd all been evacuated because, of course, the Pentagon had been attacked. And we didn't know where Flight 93 was headed. 
And in the four or five hours when I couldn't get anybody on the phone in Washington, the European allies came to me in, at NATO and they said, we want to invoke Article 5 of the NATO treaty. Article 5, this is Harry Truman's 1949 treaty. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us at the Mutual Defense Clause. It was written in so that the Americans and Canadians would go across the pond a third time in the 20th century to defend Europe as 1949 against what they expected would be Stalin's invasion to destroy dem democracy in Western Europe. The invasion never came because we had Article 5, because we had 300,000 American troops in Europe between the 1940s and the 1990s, because we stood with them. And the huge historical irony is the only time we ever invoked Article 5 was September 12, 2001, the next morning. And the Europeans all voted to defend us against Al-Qaeda. They all went into Afghanistan with us, and they're still there 17 and a half years later. They're in Kandahar, Oruzgan, Helmand, Paktia province. They're up north. They're side by side with our soldiers. You can't buy this kind of allegiance in the modern world, but our diplomats are the glue that holds that NATO alliance together. And if you're interested in peace in the Middle East, and that's a vision on the far horizon, unfortunately. The far horizon. But if we as Americans want to help the, fair, the four failed states after the Arab revolutions, Libya in crisis, and Yemen, the victim of a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and Iraq divided into three parts, unfortunately, Shia stand in the south, the Sunnis in Anbar, the Kurds largely autonomous, but a country split apart. If we want to end the Syrian civil war, it's going to be an American diplomat who does that. It's going to be someone like Ambassador Stevenson, someone senior who knows the world. Let me give you a few data points about that war. 22.4 million Syrians were in the country in January 2011 when the, civil, when the revolution started. Over 12 million of them are homeless. 12 million Syrians homeless out of a population of 22.4 million. Seven million homeless inside the country, blasted out of their homes by the Russian Air Force, by the Syrian Air Force. You've seen the bombing of Ghouta, suburb just outside of Damascus the last couple of days. Use of chlorine gas, chemical weapons, 60 Minutes report on Sunday night, harrowing to see what they've done. The Iranian Revolutionary Guards on the ground, Hezbollah on the ground, and we're AWOL. We don't have an American ambassador in Syria. We withdrew our embassy. We're not part of the peace negotiations right now. We're letting the Russians and the Iranians and the Turks determine what happens there. Sooner or later, it's going to end at a diplomatic negotiation, and we're going to have to have an experienced senior Arabist there. But if you cut your workforce from 8,000 diplomats by 8 to 10 percent, if you only take in 100 officers this year, not 370 the way we have, and those are the plans, we're going to be hard-pressed to field a fully-fledged diplomatic corps in the future. So there's a lot at stake that challenges us. There are a lot of positive opportunities for us. Contribute to poverty alleviation. There's been more of that in the last 30 years than any time in human history. We can be part of that. Contribute to eradicating polio. We haven't eradicated a global disease since smallpox. We can eradicate polio in the next three to five years if we have the money in the State Department budget to fund vaccine programs, if we have the diplomats to run them. We can contribute to the end of malaria. Bill Gates believes it can be done in the next 20 to 25 years. That's going to be civilian-led. That'll save several million African kids' lives every year if we eradicate malaria. These are great positive goals, along with the firefighting that we have to do. But it's going to be civilians and military together. And if you fully fund one and don't fund the other, America's going to be weaker, less capable, and certainly less successful in the world. Let me end my sermon, <laughs> and apologies for the sermon, uh, with a quote from Churchill. He had a lot of great quotes. But it's a story about Harvard and Cambridge and this city and Churchill. He came here to Boston and to uh, the university where I teach, Harvard, uh, in September 1943. He had just met FDR. It was a turning point in the war 
because the British had stopped Rommel at El Alamein in the western desert just west of Alexandria. They hadn't stopped them. The Germans would have seized the Suez Canal and that could have turned the war against the Allies. The Soviets had just stopped the German Sixth Army in Stalingrad. A million people died in that battle. 20 million Soviets died in the war, but they'd stopped them and the Red Army had begun its advance slowly, but it advanced towards Berlin. And we had just begun the invasion of Italy to defeat Mussolini. This was a big turning point. Churchill could see and Roosevelt could see that we were finally on a victorious glide path. It would take a couple of more years. Churchill went and addressed the students at Harvard. Many of them were men, young men training for the military. And here's what he said. And he said it at a time when Britain was, for the first time in 200 years, waning as the, glo the great global empire. And the United States, just about 1943, was becoming the most powerful country in the world. And Churchill said to the students at Harvard, the price of greatness is responsibility. The price of greatness is responsibility. You want to be a great nation? You want to win this war? You want to lead the world out of the war? You've got to be responsible in the way you act. It's irresponsible to decimate the Department of State with a 30% budget cut. It's irresponsible to say we're going to hit North Korea with a preventive war before we have tried diplomacy. It's irresponsible to let 12 million Syrians, and that number could be 13 or 14 million before we know it, live lives of misery because we're not there to negotiate a difficult peace agreement with the Russians and the Iranians because we have no senior diplomats to do so in the Middle East right now. So this is a big test of us, of the American people. And I couldn't be prouder of the work that Barbara's been doing and all of our brethren, men and women in the State Department have been doing. Please write your member of Congress, write the great Joe Kennedy or Seth Moulton or Senator Markey or Senator Elizabeth Warren. Get them involved in this fight please join the chorus to defend the proposition that the United States of America, the greatest country in the world today, has a first-rate diplomatic corps. Thank you. I have to read a quote because it comes from last night's speaker, interestingly, that we had, James Stavridis. He said, in, in terms of danger, he's a four-star retired uh, admiral, and I wonder if he was Supreme Allied Command of NATO when you were, he was, okay, after you, okay. Um, kind of oriented to the military. Uh, and he says, in terms of danger, I cannot think of a higher risk for the US than to have widely perceived weakness emanating from the State Department. Wow, it's not exactly what you would expect. Uh, anyway, so we're going to actually move to um, audience Q&A. We've got uh, about half an hour. What's going to happen is that um, my wonderful colleagues are going to be passing the mic. Um, please wait for the mic to come to you. And uh, please let your question be a question. Knowing what you both know now, um, if you were to turn back the clock, however many number of appropriate years, uh, would you join the Foreign Service again? Aha! Okay, that is a stimulating, crisp question. And uh, Mary? Uh, how do you explain all of what you said to a man whose worldview seems to be very transactional, uh, that is Trump, he and his family, and Rex Tillerson, a guy who seems to look at the State Department as something to be downsized like a company. Knowing what I know now, I would I have joined absolutely in a heartbeat. When I, was, when I got in, I thought I'd won the lottery several, several times over. And you know, most days when I go to work, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing than what I've been able to do. So in a heartbeat, absolutely. And I already mentioned it's my daughter's aspiration. So mm -hmm. no question about that. I think sometimes you have to broaden the conversation about when you don't know if your message is landing, then it's really important to talk to a broader range of people who, like Admiral Stavrides, like, like you, who have spent your Tuesday evening on a gorgeous 
night in here thinking about this, like Republican members of Congress who have really rallied to the idea that 32% cuts to the budget are tantamount to a doctrine of retreat and that these relationships really matter. So I think sometimes if your message isn't landing, it's important to have a broader conversation, mm -hmm. a national conversation about our role in the world. And that really is, it sounds a little bold for the for me to say, but that's been what I've been seeking to do, is spark a national conversation so that many more voices come in. If there is a good reason to take apart the State Department, then let's hear it. Let's hear it. I will say we do have a new national security strategy now. And on page one, the president um, says that the world is an extraordinarily dangerous place and the threats are just mounting and getting more dangerous. It's one. And then on page 34, it says, we must upgrade our diplomatic capability to compete in this environment. To which I say, amen and amen. But then why submit a 30% budget cut to Congress? <coughs> it's not coherent. So in the mid-90s, we made a terrible mistake and we cut back hiring and we cut back promotions and then we were in big trouble when Nick and I worked on Iraq uh, a dozen years later because if you don't start building your deep bench of seasoned leaders 12 years out, when you need them, they're not there. So we learned our lesson. But that in the mid-90s, I remember that conversation and we said, you know, the Berlin Wall fell, we won the Cold War, we can kind of take a victory lap here and pull our diplomats back in and focus on home. We didn't get that right. It turned out, in hindsight, to be a terrible mistake, but we had a national conversation. We should be having a national conversation today. Does it make any sense in the face of rising threats when our own national security strategy says we must upgrade our diplomatic capability to be cutting the funding for diplomacy by 30%? I don't see the logic. So I'll just say very briefly, I, I agree with Barbara. I, w I wouldn't trade a day of, of my career. Uh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. What a tremendous honor to serve the United States overseas and in Washington. I think our families felt that way. I know my wife and kids did. I think your family felt that way, and we, and we did. Um, a lot of us in our generation weren't old when President Kennedy called us into public service. I think I was five. But when you got <laughs> older, you know, that was replayed in our teachers and a church that we all had an obligation to serve. I think a lot of us were affected by that. In my case, uh, I was 17 at Wellesley High School the week the Vietnam War ended. I turned 17. And that war had come into our homes, into our living rooms, into our family conversations. It split our community here in Boston split my hometown, certainly, and I really wanted to go into diplomacy, you know, very idealistic 17-year-old, thinking, can we not do this again? Can we prevent a catastrophic mistake? We both live through another catastrophic mistake. I'll just say this, because I'm no longer serving. Uh, the Iraq War <laughs> of 2003, which I supported when I was ambassador to NATO, and I now deeply regret it. And so we diplomats have to always you know, look into our conscience and look into our minds and say, how can we do better as a country? On the second question, I'd just say, um, I think Secretary Tillerson is a really fine person. And I think he's trying with, with huge respect to him. And he's got a great international pedigree. He's traveled around the world. He ran our biggest company, which is a global company, Exxon Mobil. He doesn't understand the State Department, clearly. If he thinks we can just take a third of it, and just wipe it away and fire people and have no senior leadership. Barbara will give you the figures. Our top leaders have been, leadership ranks have been decimated and we're not taking in young people. He's made a series of catastrophic mistakes. But I think what we've got to do is just accentuate the importance of diplomacy, rely on people like Secretary Mattis, star of the cabinet, who understands diplomacy, We've had several hundred retired admirals and generals sign public letters saying to the president, please don't cut the State Department because we in the military need them to play their role. As for President Trump, I won't mince my words. We have a leadership crisis in Washington. He's unfit for the job. He's dividing us. He's bringing race back as a problem. Look at his Charlottesville remarks. He is embarrassing us overseas by embracing authoritarian leaders and not communicating and reaching out to great leaders like Angela Merkel, probably the most respected leader in the world today. So I fear 
that the credibility and influence of the United States is ebbing, and we've got to all work to try to re-strengthen, to strengthen our country and restore our power when he leaves. So Turkey is heading south at an increasingly rapid rate. How do we bring them back into the fold if we can? Yes, uh, my question relates to uh, the, role, the role of the ambassador uh, in service. Um, my last assignment uh, in the Army was teaching at the National War College, and about mm -hmm. 20 to 25 percent of the student body is uh, from the State Department. And that was a great opportunity for State Department people, military, other agencies to learn about each other, meet each other, and uh, hopefully uh, build upon those relationships. But when you're in country, the ambassador is the senior representative of the president, and you have to coordinate all those agencies. And we usually hear about the failures of interagency coordination, but I'd like to hear some of your, your thoughts on the challenges and successes that you had. So we disagreed. I'll, I'll, we disagreed. I'll take the first question, and Barbara takes the second one, okay. uh, just to get as many questions in as possible. Turkey's a really tough challenge. It's the second largest military in NATO. Uh, it's been a member since 1952, but right now the Turks are buying an air defense system from the Russians in order to get our attention. Uh, and they're also facing off with American special forces in northern Syria. And President Erdogan's been threatening to attack the American special forces. We actually hold about one-third of Syria, <coughs> the American special forces with our Syrian Kurdish allies. The Turks, of course, are neuralgic about the Kurds. They believe the Syrian Kurds with, with, with whom we are working are terrorists uh, related to the PKK, the, Turkish, the, the, P, the Kurdish group that the Turks believe is an enemy of their state. And so President Trump, and I would, I would say something positive about him in this regard, got on the phone with President Erdogan 10 days ago and said, we cannot have our two countries facing off. We're NATO allies. The Turks, I think, will be restrained. Uh, they're going through a period where they're, they've ceased being a democracy. Erdogan, President Erdogan is taking power into his own office. There are more generals in jail in Turkey than any country in the world and more journalists in jail in Turkey and judges than any country in the world. It's, it, it's a real problem for us. So we're gonna have to keep talking to the Turks, try to slowly steer them back to a relationship with the Europeans and the Americans. It's gonna take an American ambassador to do that Guess where we do not have an American ambassador right now, Ankara, because we haven't appointed anybody. Let me just say, there's not a single American president. You'd have to go back to Harding, one of our worst presidents, one of our most isolationist presidents, you know, 1921, 22, 23, to find an American president so disinterested in appointing ambassadors and practicing diplomacy. And so we're going to have to find our way back to a civil relationship, I think ultimately will bring the Turks back. But because some brilliant team of diplomats will do that over four or five or six years, that's what it's gonna take. I'm actually gonna use, I don't know what, executive privilege. What happens, expert diplomats, when you don't have an ambassador? What do you, what do? You do? And, then, and then we'll get back to coordination on the ground. It's a whole lot harder to um, exercise clear leadership. That kind of um, pulling together of this whole interagency team, this, which is what you would want in, in Ankara, it works far better when you have a confirmed ambassador uh, in place than it does when you have somebody that's acting in a charge role. Not to say that whoever's there in the acting capacity isn't giving it their, their best shot, but it's just not as effective than when you don't carry the title. You can probably elaborate on that, Nick. <laughs> can I do so, the one on, on challenges here? Sure, and then uh, we also had that, that interesting question about coordination. Uh, that was it. So first of all, thank you for that question because I, I was telling Linnea, the one thing I really didn't get to in my remarks was the joy of leading as ambassador a big, broad interagency team. So I think it's so often talked about in terms of the difficulty of coordination. It is actually the most gorgeous, awesome display of America's prowess at work is to see a well-led embassy pulling all of those agencies, your law enforcement team, your military components, your intelligence components, 
orchestrating all of that together to achieve an outcome. I know in Panama, we had it for 20 years, we'd been facing a huge problem in the Darien province, that impassable gap between Panama and Colombia. It had been a FARC staging ground for um, gun transfers. And then it had become a really important landing place for the narcotics flow. So now you had money going up and guns going back. And the murder rate in Panama doubled, and we were really concerned because the canal is a strategic waterway, and we couldn't really afford to have Panama turn into a narco state. We put together a fabulous interagency program with our Office of Defense Cooperation, our DIA, our FBI, which got the indictments, our public affairs people who got some grants in to work with the indigenous people, our AID people who, built a, who were able to build up a forestry school to help win the indigenous population to our side. And so after I left, um, an inspection report came in, and it had a great line in it. It said, with the FARC, the, the guerrillas from Colombia, no longer operating in the Darien province, comma, and it went on to say all, all kinds of other things were possible, and it was such a wonderful feeling. For 20 years, they've been running circles around us, and we pulled an interagency program together with the help of Southern Command, which Admiral Cerritos used to run, and were able to pull this off. These are the kinds of things that we still write to each other at Christmas and send Christmas cards and go, wasn't that great? <laughs> so I have to say, yes, there are challenges in the coordination, but it's also the most rewarding part of being an American ambassador. So hmm. thank you for your service. OK, let's get a couple more. Keep your hands up, because i got to figure out who's, who's doing what here. Uh, OK, so we'll uh, come back over to uh, this side. We'll take you, sir, and then you in the pink sweater. Um, over the last 10 years, Funding for democratization programs has fallen precipitously. I think 2010, it had hit a peak. Now, that, that predates Trump, which tells me that uh, the sheen of democratization programs is beginning to wane. Okay. Can you explain what, what the cause of that would be and, and the importance of democratization programs now with the uh, onset of, na of uh, Great. nationalism programs? Okay, thank you. And then uh, I think it's Maggie there. My question is, how do we initiate a national discourse on diplomacy? This is wonderful, but this is Boston. We have schools here, we have the intellectual. It has to be national. How do we do it? Thank you. I, I'm a big fan of trying to, to really push for um, anti-corruption, good governance. I think that that is the real sweet spot for the United States going forward. I'd love to have a long conversation with you about this. I can get completely off the deep end in this thing, but I believe it is the way forward. <laughs> and then on the, the question of how to have that national conversation, I think we need all of you to come out and have a conversation with somebody else after you leave here. We need you to write some letters to the editor or maybe to some other people, like Nick suggested. I'm not allowed to actually urge anyone to... Uh, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> Nick can. I cannot ask anyone to lobby their, their congressman or woman, so I would not do that. Um, but it's also important to, get, to have these conversations like this in Boston, why it matters to Boston. I got to go with uh, the House Agricultural Committee. Congressman Waltz from Minnesota invited me out to Farm Fest in Minnesota this summer. Mm -hmm. And you know, if there's a group of people who understand the importance of keeping American diplomats in the field, you know what? It's people who grow corn and soy. Farmers. Because mm -hmm. they understand really clearly that the price of their crops depends upon us year after year convincing China and other companies to buy more of them. So this conversation can be had, but I think requires all of us to write about it, to, um, to talk about it to others. And I, I don't actually have the pat answer, but I'm so glad that you asked it. Nick's going to do a better job now. <laughs> Not at all, but I just say, in answer to your very good question, we could organize a whole course around that at one of our local universities. It's a good one. But um, <laughs> I think that for, for a lot of reasons, President Clinton uh, and President George W. Bush both felt that funding uh, democratization programs worldwide was important. You can see why you'd want to do that in Myanmar. You now have more than a million Rohingya refugees because of a dictatorship in Myanmar. You'd see why you'd want to have open internet in places like Russia, in China that are trying to close off uh, their citizens from access to the internet. 
You definitely want to do that in Western and Eastern Europe, where in Hungary and Poland, the governments are so far to the right, anti-democratic, that they've really ceased being members of the democratic community. So I'm with you, or at least what was implied in your question. We've got to get back to this. I just say very quickly, what's changed under President Trump? Four big things. He's not standing up for democracy and human rights. He doesn't talk about it the way that President Reagan did, or President George W. Bush did, or President Eisenhower, just name three Republican presidents. President Trump went to Warsaw and literally embraced this right-wing authoritarian government that's trying to stamp out the rule of law in Poland. And so that's a big change, along with dissing our allies, criticizing NATO, criticizing the South Korean government, our ally, as President Trump has done, as long as shutting down all the multilateral trade agreements, President Trump said no to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 40% of global GDP. That's the rising tide that lifts all boats. That's what grows the global economy. He said no to the US-EU free trade agreement. Those are the two largest economies in the world, Europe and America. And for New Englanders, who depend on a peaceful border and a prosperous border, with Canada, the longest undefended border in the world, President Trump's threatening in the next six to 12 weeks to end the NAFTA agreement that has been for Mexico and Canada and the United States a godsend. It's expanded all three of our economies in our symbiotic North America union among the three of us. And I just say, so he's changed our policy on democratization, on alliances, on trade, and he's changed it on immigration and refugees. If, I, if we went around the room and I asked everybody in the room, where are you from? And I didn't mean, are you from Arlington or Wellesley or Chelsea or Hingham? Where are you from? Each of us has an immigrant story. E pluribus unum. Out of many people become one American people. That's on the great seal of the United States. President Trump wants to half cut immigration in half. And he basically wants to bring in a lot of Norwegians. <laughs> Nobody wants to come from Norway. They just <laughs> won 39 medals in, in the Olympics, and they've got the most beautiful life imaginable. But there are, there are hardworking people from sub-Saharan Africa who want to be Americans, and from Pakistan and Bangladesh, and from Malaysia and Indonesia. And, you know, we're Massachusetts. A lot of us are Irish Catholics and Italians, and our relatives came over at a time of prejudice when we had a religious means test. No Catholics should come into this country. That was what the know-nothings said. That's what the Yankees said. Not the New York Yankees, the <laughs> Boston Brahmin Yankees. I never thought we'd get back to saying that Muslims from 11 majority Muslim nations should not come into the United States. That's what President Trump's saying. So we're looking at a sea change in what every Republican and Democratic president since FDR thought, this is what makes us great. We have allies and we honor them and we're stronger because of them. We have the self-confidence to trade. We know that immigration and refugees are at the heart of the American experience and that we have to keep our doors open. And we know that we're the leading democracy in the world and we've got to support democracy. The president's saying no to all four of those. We've got to take our country back. Republicans have to take their party back. And the independents and Democrats and Bernie Sanders socialists need to get involved to make sure that we're still open to the rest of the world. So I want to take advantage of your question and say that. We really have way too many questions. We're going to take a quick one uh, all the way in the back, the very top row, and uh, the answers will be in haiku. He touched on this, uh, and I'm interested to know what sort of political future he sees for General Mattis if indeed he cares to talk about that. I said before, I think Secretary Mattis is the star of the cabinet. I was just in Munich at the security conference uh, 10 days ago, and I can tell you, I, I was in some meetings with him with Europeans. They deeply respect and trust him because he's an internationalist. He's a warrior. He's a four-star Marine Corps general. He's fought for the country in several wars, but he's also a man who understands that we need to get our way through diplomacy, He's very big on the State Department. He's the guy who said, if you cut the State Department budget, you have to buy me more bullets. So he kind of put it, he just got to the heart of the matter. I don't know if he has a political future, that's up to him. 
But I, I think he's the best Trump appointee, Secretary of Mattis. I deeply respect him. Okay, so uh, we actually uh, are out of time, and we have uh, so many more great questions, and I'm, we know uh, so many interesting observations and uh, thoughts from our ambassadors, but all we have time left to do is thank them so much, and thank all of you for being here. Come back and see World Boston again soon. Thank you.